Romans 8, 16 through 23. I'll put it up here. For those of us who are in the building today, not many, but those of us who are here. Amen. Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 16 and reading through verse 23. And the word of the Lord today reads from the King James text. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our bodies. If you bow your heads with me one more time this afternoon, Father, once again, Lord, we thank you for the Word of God. It is our most pos uh, precious possession today. And Lord, we carry the Word of God in our heart. As David said, Thy Word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against Thee. And yet, Lord, there is a divine exercise that you have given the church. It involves the preaching, the declaring of the Word of God in the hearing of believers. And you declare in your Word, God, that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. There are times when circumstances in life and circumstances in our world begin to chip away at our faith. And we need that faith restored and renewed and revived. And that occurs, God, when we subject and submit ourselves to the hearing of the preached Word of God. But Lord, even hearing... A message from your divine word is not enough. There must be an anointing upon the speaker. It is essential, Lord, that the Holy Ghost from heaven ride upon wings of love as the word of God goes forth. That the Holy Ghost touch the ear of every hearer and help them to understand and receive that which they hear as a divine word from heaven and not merely as words from a page. Master, I implore you today, we are going through so much as a people, as a nation, our world today. We need the anointed preached word of God. I need you to anoint me, Lord, in order that the people of God can benefit from that which I speak today. That which I deliver, which I believe you gave me, Lord, to deliver. Allow the speaker today, God, to be anointed of the Holy Ghost. 
Allow the ear to be anointed to receive, for we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Amen. The Apostle Paul speaks in Romans chapter 8 in our primary text today of the fact that the Holy Ghost witnesses to us, speaks to our spirit, and allows us to know that we are in fact and indeed already the children of God. Hallelujah. We're not perfect. We're not sinless. We're not superhuman or somehow divine. And yet God has made a provision so that we today can know by the testimony and the witness of God's Spirit that we are in fact and indeed children of the Most High God. But what we are today and what we're experiencing today is not all that we will ever be. That is, this is not all that God would have for us. There is so much more, but that hour is yet to come. We're not yet fully realized people. We're not yet fully realized born-again believers. There is more to the divine transaction of salvation than merely what we experience in our bodies today. No, Paul said, no, there's a whole lot more coming. Unfortunately, as we wait for the promise that is before us, we have to go like a mother who is expecting a child. We have to go through labor pains. It hurts. It hurts bad. If you talk to some who have given birth to children, they will tell you that the nine months leading up to the birth of that child is no picnic either. You know, we love to think about uh, the experience of giving birth and we think about the fact that it is a very painful number of hours and for some poor women even days that they go through as they're in labor and they're experiencing contractions and their body is racked with pain and they go through so much but we forget that there are nine months before that experience of actually giving birth during which an expected mother is miserable. She goes through all kinds of painful experiences. I don't want to embarrass my mother, but I've heard some stories. I know some of what women go through. One of the terrible things that ladies can experience while they're pregnant is hemorrhoids. Yes, I said the word. Any of us who have ever experienced these demonic things know that they can be extremely painful, extremely uncomfortable. They can make you extremely miserable. And a lot of expectant mothers go through a long period of time where they have to live with this infirmity. Mothers who are expecting go through backaches because of all the weight at the front of them. They go through the uh, uncomfortable and embarrassing situations often of sitting down in a chair and then being like a turtle that's turned over on its uh, shell. They're not able to get up and they need somebody to put their foot on their foot and grab hold of their hand and give them a good tug because uh, their body is shaped and it is weighted in such a fashion that they're not easily able to get up from a seated position. There are many discomforts and there are many pains that expectant mothers go through long before they get into the labor room. Long before the doctor is near them and the nurses are preparing the water to wash the newborn baby. 
I'm here to tell you today that as children of God, we go through and experience much like pregnancy, much like labor. There are times in our Christian walk and in our Christian experience as we wait upon the Lord to perfect us, as we wait upon the Lord to clothe us in righteousness and true holiness and in incorruption, there are times we're miserable. There are times we're in pain. And we hadn't even hit the labor room yet. Oh, but the closer you get to the, what do they call the birth of a baby? I, I hadn't heard too many mothers refer to it as the blessed curse or, you know, anything of that nature. No, usually they talk about the blessed event. You remember that old saying? The, oh, when are you expecting the blessed event? Blessed event? What are you talking about, blessed event? I'm going to be spread eagle on a on a table and I'm going to be uh, screaming and hollering my full head off and going through all kind of pain. What are you talking about, blessed event? Uh, because, honey, as soon as that baby is birthed, you forget all about the pain. You forget about the nine months. You forget about the last 16 hours or 24 hours or four hours, however long it was, that you were in the process of giving birth and going through labor pains. There is something so wonderful about holding that baby and looking into those newborn eyes there is something so wonderful about knowing that from this moment forward you will be a mother. You're a mommy. And you look into that little baby's eyes and you know what? When you talk to people about having this child, I haven't spoken to a whole lot of mothers. Now there, I'm sure there are some out there. But I haven't spoken to a whole lot of mothers who... When you talk to them about having their children, then all they talk about is the pain. All they talk about is how miserable they were for nine months and how uncomfortable they were for nine months and how uh, much agony they went through during the process of labor. No, most mothers will talk about how thrilled they were. I'll never forget my firstborn. I'll never forget the first time that I held my son or my daughter. I'll never forget how it felt to know that I was now a mommy. I was officially a mother. There is a joy that comes after the pain. There is a joy and a thrill that comes after the misery, after the suffering. During the course of that nine-month pregnancy, mom knows that there is a hope for something wonderful at the end. And this is one reason why women who lose children and who... who miscarry and who still birth and what have you. This is one reason why it is so devastating to their psyche because there was such an expectation and there was such an anticipation of great joy and then to have that stolen from them and for them not to be able to realize this, it's devastating. And I understand that because for that whole period of pregnancy, we operate under the prospect of anticipation. We operate within the realms of hope and anticipation and expectation. That's why we say, when, you know, when are you expecting? Because there's expectation. You know, you don't just see a pregnant woman running around saying, well, one day, sometime, somewhere, um, this thing's going to happen. I don't know when. I have no clue. I have no idea. No, usually the doctor is able to put a pretty close number on it. Of course, my doctor, from what I understand, my doctor was about 10 days off, I believe my mother said. I think she said I was 10 days late or so. I made her wait a little bit longer than he thought. But if you ask most mothers today, 
to compare their pregnancy and to compare their labor to the joy of holding that brand new baby, most mothers would answer what I've titled my message today. No comparison whatsoever. Hey, many mothers after having one proceed to have another. My mother proceeded to have two more. So there must have been a greater joy at the end than there was pain and agony during the course of the uh, pregnancy and during the course of the labor. There has to be, or else my mother surely would have done something to make certain that she never had to go through that again. Am I telling the truth? My grandmother on my dad's side had 12 children. My grandmother on my mother's side had 10 children. There must surely have been some joy that made the pain, the agony worthwhile. I'm here to tell you today, children, as children of God, as heirs to the kingdom of God, we have so much more to look forward to than all the pain and all the woe we may go through in this present life. Hallelujah. And I've got news for you today. There is no comparison whatsoever. You can't even begin to compare how wonderful it's going to be with how miserable it presently is. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? We're going through an experience in our world today and in our country today. Politically, our country is in shambles. We have no federal government. We have a circus. Yes, I said it. That is my opinion, and I share it freely. We're going through a health crisis. A pandemic has struck our world. People, the globe over, are growing sick. Many are dying. Many families today are grieving, and what makes it even worse is they can't even go to the local funeral home and schedule a funeral service so that they can have closure and so that they can grieve the loss of their loved ones. No, everything is on hold. Bodies are being stacked in refrigerated trucks. I mean, this, this is a nightmare right out of a horror movie, folks. We're going through things. I, I read in California there was one church that insisted upon having services. And they said that some 70 people in this one church wound up thus far uh, being tested positive for coronavirus. I got news for you, children. I'm going to tell you, a lot of people love to take the Word of God out of context. They love to pull it apart and they love to shred it. And there are preachers who love to preach it in such a fashion as to make it say something it does not say. I've got news for you. I've been, I've been preaching this now for decades because it's something I believe that uh, most preachers and most churches fail to preach and I think it sends a false message and a wrong message to God's people but the word of God says that God causes his son to rise upon the good and the bad and he causes his reign to fall on the just and the unjust what does that mean that means that in the realms of nature listen to me now in the realms of nature Things that occur in the natural realm affect both the godly and the ungodly. They affect both the believer and the unbeliever. They affect both the saint and the sinner. Therefore, it is idiotic and foolish to scream that the church is being persecuted because we can't have meetings on account of a health crisis. No, that has nothing in the universe to do with the church being persecuted. If they were telling you you couldn't meet because they didn't like what you preached, or they didn't like the gospel of Jesus Christ, or they didn't like your doctrine, then it would be persecution. But when the... the uh, Authorities are making declarations 
because of something going on within the natural world, something going on within uh, the world of health and well-being, uh, then as children of God, you ought to have the wisdom and the brains to know that you need to follow those rules. The Word of God tells us that we're to abide and we're to live according to the law of the land. We're to obey the law of the land. So insisting upon meeting, because after all, the Bible said that uh, no plague shall touch you, no plague shall come near you. Well, apparently you read that wrong, because 70 of your people wound up sick, didn't they? Sure did. Mm -hmm. You're taking something out of context. You're trying to apply something that is not written for this purpose and has nothing to do with what is happening at this time, as believers today, we experience good and bad. That's something a lot of preachers don't tell us. I remember growing up as a kid, I have to admit, in the Pentecostal church, I have to admit that there was a tendency to preach this false notion that all was well with the world because you're a child of God. Everything good would come your way and God would deliver you or prevent you from experiencing anything painful or anything negative or anything that would cause you distress. But that is not scriptural. One of the greatest men of God to ever walk planet earth was the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul wrote the majority of the New Testament for the benefit of Gentile believers. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 22 through 30, let's read about the blessed life of Paul. Let's read about the favored life of Paul. How God spared him any trouble. How God spared him any pain. Paul writes, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? Then he says, I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors, more abundant. In stripes, above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Who is weak? And I am not weak. Who is offended? And I burn not. If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. My Lord have mercy. It sounds like before Paul received his promotion to glory, he went through quite a pregnancy. Yeah. It sounds like before Paul experienced his 
uh, elevation to the presence of God that Paul went through quite a labor. Amen. Yeah. He experienced so much pain. But we live in America and we have churches in America which have allowed secular culture to inform our theology. Mm -hmm. Oh, this has been going on for decades, folks. Many, many, many decades. Why, we're the most prosperous land on the planet. We're the most prosperous nation on the planet. And we brag of our wealth, and we brag of our abundance, and we have television shows that literally celebrate decadence and sumptuous living. We have shows that showcase expensive homes and expensive cars. And they love, people who own these homes love to brag about all the features that they built into them and how much it cost them. Why, it cost me $40 million to build this house. Oh, but if a hurricane comes, we've got these shades that come down over the outside of our windows that will prevent any damage from coming. And we've got footings that go down into the earth some 50 feet or so. And blah, blah. and all I mean, they're, they're just certain that no calamity can touch them. They're certain that they have prepared themselves and protected themselves against anything that could possibly come, except, of course, for a microscopic virus. That's right. A little Tanimsi virus can come along and wipe you and your family out. And you know what? All those millions of dollars you spent on that home are not going to help you and they are not going to protect you. All you need is one encounter with the wrong person. That's all it takes. But we're told by preachers in America that God wants us prosperous. That God wants us wealthy and rich and He wants us to have abundance. The only problem is that is not what the Word of God says. The Word of God says that my God shall supply all of your needs. That's right. According to His riches and glory. I've got news for you today, honey. A Rolls Royce has never been a need. It will never be a need. A mansion on the hilltop has never been a need. It will never be a need. Uh, having millions of dollars in the bank and furs and jewels and diamonds and pearls, those things are nowhere near being a need. We've got believers who are so caught up in the materialism and the consumerism of secular American society that now our theology in so many churches today reflects the greed and avarice of secularism mm -hmm. and preachers and pastors and ministers and even many in the pews today are blind to the fact that they have been led astray and led into false doctrine. And hearing me say this today, there will be many who are going to rip off. There are going to be many who are going to uh, get their ire up and they're going to become angry. Oh, he's not telling the truth. The Word of God said, I would that you prosper even as your soul prospers. Yeah, it certainly does say that. But I'm going to tell you something. If I'm eating and I've got a roof over my head and I've got a way of conveyance that can get me from point A to point B, whether it be an old Volkswagen Beagle, Beetle or whether it be a Cadillac Eldorado, it doesn't matter to me. As long as my needs are met, I've got news for you, honey. I'm prospering. Amen. Ask any plant. Ask any fruited plant or any plant that brings forth fruit if they're prospering and they'll say well you see corn on my stuff don't you well you see berries in my branches don't you hello now you see fruit in my limbs don't you yes I'm prospering does that mean that it's producing more fruit, that it's producing more corn, that it's producing more berries than any other plant of that kind has ever produced? No. But so long as it's producing fruit, 
it's prospering. Were it not prospering, it would wither and die. So the truth of the matter today is the prosperity gospel, which, my friend, I have news for you, is the lie from hell. The prosperity gospel has interpreted prosperity in a manner that is advised by secular consumerism and greed. I have family members who call themselves great Christians. And I've had conversations with them. And I cannot believe sometimes the things that I've heard come out of their mouths when it comes to their views on politics and what have you. I don't want my tax dollars helping somebody else's kid to go to college. I don't want my tax dollars helping someone else to be healthy and helping them to survive and helping them to live longer and live better. No. What? And you call yourself a Christian and you have this attitude? I got news for you, honey. What I'm hearing come out of your mouth is so inconsistent with Christian thinking, it's not even funny. A Christian would should be thinking in whatever way it happens, I am always happy to be a help. I'm always happy to be a hand up. I'm always happy to be a blessing to my neighbor. If that occurs by reason of taxation, then okay, so be it. Mm -hmm. That saves me having to figure out which charities to give to. That saves me having to figure. And what cracks me up, though, is most of these people, you know, say, oh, if I want to give... Uh, to charity, I'll give to charity. But you know what makes me laugh? Most of them don't. Mm -hmm. They have every excuse in the world to be selfish and greedy, just like the worldliest unbeliever among us. And they give themselves license to do so. Why? Because we have been falsely informed by false prophets and false teachers and false preachers. <sighs> That the life of a believer is supposed to be charmed. That everything is supposed to go well. That we are never supposed to experience anything negative. And we're never supposed to have to experience it. You know it's funny because if that were true, then 90% of the Old Testament would not exist. If that were true, then most of the New Testament would not exist. Because when you read Paul's writings, he often writes of the suffering that he's going through. He often writes of the troubles that he's having to endure and the experiences that he's going through. If it weren't for believers having to go through the same horrors and the same troubles as the unbeliever, John would never have been exiled to the Isle of Patmos, where Jesus Christ of Nazareth, God manifest in the flesh, was able to reveal himself as the Almighty God to John. I got news for you, honey. The only difference, the only difference between a child of God and an unbeliever when it comes to trouble is what we come out the other end of that trouble with. Hallelujah. Yes. If we're smart and if we hold fast to our faith, we'll come out the other side of every trouble. We'll come out the other side of every labor room experience with a brand new baby. Hallelujah. Not just, I'm not just talking today about heaven. I'm not just talking today about what we have to look forward to after death. But the Word of God declares that we know all things work together for good to them that love God, to those that are the called according to His purpose. I got news for you, honey. Whatever... God has you in labor for right now, you can expect something good will come from it.
I'm going to tell you, every troublesome experience, every horror show, every nightmare that we have to live through, we can come out the other side of that nightmare with a great testimony. We can come out the other side of that nightmare with a deeper walk with God and a deeper understanding of God than we've ever before had. Well, I'll tell you something, if you play this thing smart, what we're going through today as a child of God, you can come out the other end of this thing and be so much wiser and know so much better how to navigate your way through this life. See, unbelievers and sinners, as we call them, uh, they're not the only people who need to learn how to live life and live it well. They're not the only people who need to learn lessons in this life, how to better manage their money, how to better manage their health, how to better manage their home. Am I telling the truth now? No, we all need to learn these lessons. Well, you can either be an unbeliever who sits around miserable and gripes and complains about everything that's going on, or you can be a child of God who says, I know that whatever God has me in labor for right now, something wonderful and beautiful is coming when it's all over. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. See, that's the promise that the children of God have today. We know that whatever we're in labor for right now, whatever we're expecting right now, I've been praying, I made it known in, I've been trying to send out more emails than I normally send out, primarily so we can just stay in touch while everybody's held up in their homes. I'm trying to stay in touch with everybody and just kind of touch base, you know. And before this coronavirus thing broke out, I made mention of the fact that I was believing God for 2020, that by the end of the year I could get all my debt paid and get all that taken care of. I haven't been able, because of my cancer diagnosis and all this, I hadn't been able to drive Uber in quite a long time. I hadn't been able to make any kind of money. I've had to use a lot of credit in order just to, to pay bills. I've, I've had to, you know, as the old saying goes, rob from Peter to pay Paul and all that. And it's been hard. The last year or so has been extremely hard. And I said, I'm believing God the, uh, to help me pay all my debt off by the end of 2020. And then all this happens. And all of this is going to play great havoc with people's lives and people's finances and people's jobs. We're headed for a full-blown depression. The church is going to suffer. Of course we are. Every church is going to suffer. Every church in the world, every church in America is going to suffer. Uh, Giving is going to go down because people are not going to have jobs and they're not going to have income. Oh, there's going to be a lot of financial suffering. That includes for the church. Well, what about a guy who hadn't even been able to work? And furthermore, I'm not able to collect unemployment either. Church doesn't support me. We don't get a lot of giving online. People don't give to support the work we do. Now things are getting even worse. I was thinking about this the other day. I said, Lord, Lord, uh, maybe my hope and my prayer to pay off my debt by the end of 2020 was a little mislaid. It looks like circumstances are such that that's not likely to happen. And the Lord spoke back to me and said, well, if I can't do it now, I can't do it ever. The day that your circumstance, oh hallelujah, the day that your circumstance, the day that what's going on in the world hinders me from being able to do what you need me to do is the day I'm no longer God. And I got news for you, honey. I am God, hallelujah. I will be God. I will forever be God. Your circumstance and your situation does not play havoc with me. It does not affect me. And you better remember that. I said, okay, Lord. I'm rebuked. I'm checked. Hallelujah. I'm here to tell you today, believer, whatever you're going through, whatever is happening now, it is merely labor pains. There is something wonderful. There is a blessed event ahead. Hallelujah. There is something positive and good and beneficial for you, for your life, for your soul that God has in store for you.
for you. Just remember that right now you're only in labor. Mm. Hallelujah. Right now you're only in labor. Jesus said no man that gives up houses or lands or father or mother or children. He said nobody that gives up these things and for his sake. And let me tell you, giving things up for the sake of the cross and the sake of the Lord is painful. It's hard. It's, a lot of people have had to do it. And honey, if you think just because you're doing it for the Lord that all of a sudden there's no pain involved. Uh, no, it don't work that way. Most LGBT people know better than anybody what it feels like to have to walk away from a relationship with your mother, your father, your sister, your brother, your aunt, your uncles, your cousin. People that you love, people that you admire, people that you've long appreciated, but you know what? They frown upon who you are. They frown upon, they make judgments about who you are. And for that reason, they disown you or they choose to have nothing to do with you. And most LGBT people know the pain of that. It's painful, isn't it? Mm -hmm. When people that you, you have no problem with, but they have a problem with you, and for that reason, they just cut you off and they want nothing to do with you. That's painful. Jesus said, nobody that's ever had to give anything up for my sake and for the gospel's sake, he said, will not be rewarded. Listen, he said, in the world to come, but he said more than that. He said, as well as in this life. You see, God don't expect you. There are people who are unbelievers. There are people who are not Christians. And they love to say to me, or they love to say to you and I, Oh, you know, Christians and religious people, oh, y'all are just living your lives so that you can have, uh, you know, this glorious afterlife. So your whole life, you're just wasting away so you can have a glorious heaven and a wonderful afterlife. Uh, no. That's not what we believe. Jesus Christ said, I am come that they might have life. Have life. He didn't say I've come so that they can exist. If you've ever existed and not had a life, then you know what I'm talking about. There's a difference. Jesus said, I've come that they might have life. Listen, and he didn't say that they might have it eternally. He said, now we know eternity is the promise of God, but he said, and that they might have it more abundantly. Mm -hmm. Said that their life might be more abundant. It's one thing to live life. It is another thing to live life. Hallelujah. I've said many times, Tommy and I have been blessed beyond measure as far as I'm concerned. We've been able to go on five cruises so far. I hope maybe we'll get to do some more in the future. Now I'm going to repeat for people who, who love to tout the lie that preachers are all about money and you know, blah, 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 blah. Uh, Tommy and I know how to bargain hunt. Or let me rephrase that. Charles knows how to bargain hunt. Tommy would much rather do things <laughs> a little more upscale. He'd rather have the cabin with uh, a balcony and all that, you know, and I, or a, a, even a suite. And that would be lovely. I'd love to have those things. And if we went on a cruise and they offered to upgrade us for free and put us in one, we'd have one. But honey, we know how to travel on the cheap. Listen, I'll sleep in the lifeboat as long as I'm on the ship. Because I got news for you. We all wind up at the same gorgeous tropical destinations. We all go to the same places. We all see the same scenery. We all get to enjoy the same accoutrement on the boat. You know, we all get to enjoy the same entertainment. We all get to enjoy the same hot tubs and pools and what have you, food on the ship. So it doesn't matter to me whether I'm in a room with a view or I'm in a room that's on the inside of the ship that's the cheapest. And that's how we've traveled, honestly, on the majority of our trips. But I've told Tommy, I said, you know, 
When I look at our life and I look at what God has done for us and I look at how God has blessed us, it just amazes me. It thrills me. I'm so appreciative and I'm so grateful. But you know what? I never spent one minute praying that God would put me on a cruise ship. I never prayed one minute that God would give us a house, a 2,400 square foot house with four bedrooms and two baths. That prayer was never prayed by me. No, I've been praying, Lord, help me to do the work you've called me to do. Jesus, help me to be effective. Help me to minister to people who have been pushed aside. People who have been pushed out of the church. People who feel like they have no place. People who feel like God wants nothing to do with them. Help me to restore them and reconcile them to their relationship with you. Help me to be effective, God, in, in realizing my calling. That's what my prayer is, people. I got news for you. I don't care if you put your ear on a glass and set it up against my prayer closet. That's the words you're going to hear coming out of my mouth. I don't have time to pray for cruises. I don't have time to pray for certain kinds of cars. I don't have time to pray for certain kinds of clothes. I don't have time to pray for a certain kind of house. I'm more concerned with the kingdom of God. I'm more concerned with living right and trying to be an example for the people of God. And you know what? The Word of God promises, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Do you know the Word of God says that if we put God first, if we put the kingdom of God first, that in many instances the Lord will even give us the desires of our hearts, meaning our wants rather than just our needs. The problem with most believers is they're praying for their wants rather than praying for their needs. Hello now. Jesus said, pray when you pray, pray like this. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Most people pray, they never even ask God to uh, anything concerning His kingdom because they're more focused on their little kingdom and their little life and what's going on in their little world. Give us this day our daily bread. That doesn't sound like He's telling us to pray for our wants. Sounds like He's telling us to pray for our needs. Am I telling the truth today? Yep, yep. Listen, the Word of God tells us today in Isaiah 64 and verse 4, the Word of the Lord reads, For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard, nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. Now, I'm going to remind you, the term waiteth in this passage does not mean somebody that stands and simply waits. That's not what that term means. Just like the passage that tells us, They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. The term wait here has nothing to do with simply standing in God's presence and doing nothing, waiting for Him to give orders. That's not what that term means. That term literally means wait as in a waiter. As one whose job description is one who waits tables. Means you do their bidding. Am I telling the truth? Right. I got news for you. The people that God restores and the people God gives strength to and the people that God gives wings like his eagles to are not people who stand still doing nothing, waiting on God to tell them, uh, give them a direction, but rather it is those who do God's bidding. If you're walking in the will of God, if you're walking in the light of God, if you're doing what God has asked you to do, and I got news for you, honey, a lot of times you know good and well what God would have you to do. If you need to stand around and wait for God to tell you to feed the hungry, then there's something wrong with you. If you need to stand around waiting for God to tell you to give someone who's cold a coat, if you're waiting on God to tell you to help somebody who's suffering,
suffering. If you're waiting on God to help to tell you to relieve the poor, to visit the sick, then you don't understand Christianity in the least. No, we ought to immediately know when certain circumstances come our way. We know immediately what our Father would have us to do. Mm -hmm. And we do it. And as long as we're doing what we know God would have us to do, as long as we're doing His bidding, as long as we're doing His will, He has promised that He would give us the strength and the agility and the ability to rise above every obstacle in order to accomplish that task. In the last couple of years alone, I've been diagnosed with leukemia. In the last couple of years alone, I've been diagnosed with uh, diabetes. I've gone through more physical attacks in my body. I've gone through more things. I've had my gallbladder taken out. And yet, the Sunday after I had my gallbladder taken out, where was I, Tommy? I was in the pulpit preaching the Word of God. Why? Because they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like as eagles. See, I believe the promise of God. If I didn't believe what God said, I wouldn't be trying to do what I'm doing. I could have quit years ago and had every full excuse in the world to no longer even try to minister anymore. I could have given this up. I could have retired from ministry literally years ago and been perfectly justified in doing so because of all the garbage I'm going through in my body and all the things that I've gone through in my life. But you know what? The Word of God promises as long as I do God's bidding. But listen, in Isaiah the promise said, Eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither has the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. Oh, you do God's bidding, and i got news for you. God's going to bless your life. God is going to give you abundance. God is going to give you the desire of your heart. Whatever your pregnancy, uh, whatever you're uh, going through today, whatever you're pregnant with today, whatever the pains that are upon you today, you have something to look forward to as a child of God so long as you do His will, so long as you do His bidding. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9 goes on to quote from Isaiah saying, But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. And children, I got news for you today, that don't just mean heaven. You know, I remember growing up as a kid, and I'm trying to hurry. I know I'm running out of time. I remember growing up as a kid, and, you know, our home uh, was fraught with some troubles, and, and it wasn't altogether. My father wasn't saved, and he was a miserable human being. But I looked at so many of the saints of God in the church that I grew up in, and Tommy, they were blessed. Mm -hmm. They had nice homes. Their bills were paid. They drove decent cars. Their marriages survived. Their children were well. They didn't have to bury their children. They didn't have to uh, bail their kids out of jail. I mean to tell you, I saw prosperity. I saw blessing around me. I didn't. Now, I'm not saying there were a bunch of rich people. No, these were average. You know, factory workers in southern New England who worked in the metal industries. Uh, these were people that worked hard jobs like everybody else works hard jobs. But you know what? They were blessed and they had good families. They had good marriages. They had good homes. They had good cars. They had nice clothes. Not expensive clothes. Not fancy clothes, but nice clothes. And as I grew up and I understood the Word of God better, I understood why they did. Because these people weren't living for themselves, they were living for the Lord. We got people in the church today, so oh, I live for the Lord. No, you don't, honey. You live for yourself. And Jesus is only part of the equation. You live for yourself. Every goal you have, every aspiration you have, every dream you have, it revolves around you. You're not living for the Lord. You're living for yourself. 
But as it is written, eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. It's not just heaven. It's not just the afterlife. It's not just eternity. No, God's prepared things for us that we can't even imagine here in this life if we'll just put Him in His kingdom first. Lastly today, in closing, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross he went through labor he experienced agony untold and pain we can imagine not only physical but psychological as his friends and those who said they loved him turned their back on him, and one of the men he was closest to denied him, not once, not twice, but three times. Left him standing alone in the judgment hall to be beaten, scorched, to have the hairs torn from his face, to be left naked, to be crucified on a cross, he went through that labor because he knew when the labor was over, he'd be holding something wonderful in his arms. Hallelujah. And that something wonderful would be called the church. And you and I today are part of that church. I'm here to tell you today, folks, nothing that we go through in this life that is painful, nothing that we go through in this life that hurts, no struggle, no trouble, that we experience is different than the pains of labor. Hold on to your faith. Hold on to the hand of God like we sang today, hand in hand with Jesus. Hold on to the Lord because when this labor is over, hallelujah, God is going to birth something wonderful. There is blessing at the end of every curse. Even Joseph said, that which you meant for evil, God intended for good. There is no situation, no circumstance that comes against us as the people of God. That if we'll trust Him, we'll believe Him, and we'll do His bidding. Not our own, do His bidding. Seek first His will and His ways. And when it's all over... God will bless us with something wonderful, something we'll spend the rest of our lives celebrating and thanking Him for. Hallelujah. Yes, amen. Praise the name of the Lord. There is no comparison whatsoever. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Praise the name of the Lord.